presentations and 10 spotlights. My name is Scott Linderman from Stanford University. Our first talk of this session is on generative modeling by estimating gradients of the data distribution, and it'll be presented by Yang Song. Thanks for the introduction. We can divide generative models into two categories based on how, they, how we represent a probability distribution. We have implicit models like generative adversarial networks where we directly represent the sampling process. For example, we start from some random noise, epsilon, we feed it into a generator, that will give us a sample X. What? It's okay, okay. Uh, okay, so implicit models, they are very commonly used and they provide high quality samples. However, they are generally hard to train. There is neither likelihood nor principled ways for model comparison. We also have explicit models of the other category of generative models, where we represent a probability density or mass function. There are many popular models for probability density or mass functions and I have listed a few in below. Ex explicit models are good because we know how to train them with maximum likelihood and we know how to compare them based on likelihoods. However, one limitation is that explicit models need to be normalized. As there is a trade-off between tractability, the ability to sample and evaluate likelihood efficiently, and the flexibility of distributions that one can represent this way. In this talk, I'm going to focus on another way of representing probability distribution. Notice that when the probability density function is differentiable, we can compute the gradient of the density function with respect to the random variable x. We call this quantity the score function. Be careful that this is not the gradient with respect to model parameters. For example, in the following figure, I show the density function and the score function all together for a mixture of Gaussian distribution. The density function is color coded, where darker color implies higher density. The score function is a vector field of gradients that points to directions where the log density function grows most quickly. Both density function and the score function can be viewed as equivalent ways of describing the same differentiable distribution. However, density functions have to be normalized no matter how you change the parameterization or model parameters, which might limit their flexibility. In contrast, score functions do not have difficult constraints, which make it much more flexible to parameterize. How can we estimate score function directly from data? This task is called score estimation. More formally, we have ID samples from the data distribution, which is pData. Our task is to estimate the ground truth score function of the data distribution. We propose a score model, which is a trainable vector valued function to approximate the data score. In order to train a score model, we need some objective function to measure the difference between data score and model score. Consider a vector field of uh, scores from the data distribution and vectors from the score model. We can compute the, score model, uh, the model score and data score at each point in the space, and then compute the square difference between those two vectors at each point, and average them to measure the difference between model score and data score. We can summarize this intuition into this formula, which is basically the expected square difference between data score and model score averaged over the data distribution. This objective is the well-known Fisher divergence. However, feature divergence cannot be directly computed because we do not know the ground truth data score. Luckily, we can sidestep this difficulty by integration by parts. It will give us the following objective, which is equivalent to feature divergence up to a constant. This objective is the famous score matching objective. Note that score matching does not depend on any unknown quantity, such as the data score. When we have an ID samples from the data distribution, we can estimate the score matching objective using empirical means. After training a score model with score matching, we can define a new generative model suppose we can directly sample from the score model. How can we do that? 
Suppose we have random points in the space. Can we move those random points so that they look like samples from the distribution? The most straightforward way of doing this might be moving the random samples along the direction of a scores. But this will make all the points collapse into several local attractors. Instead, there is a procedure called large event dynamics where we basically follow the scores but end a bit of Gaussian noise. It is guaranteed to provide cor correct samples under some conditions. Now we can define a new framework of genetic modeling, which we call score based genetic modeling. Suppose what we know are some ID samples from some unknown data distribution. Score based genetic modeling will first use score matching to train a score model to estimate the score function of the data distribution. Next, it will use language dynamics to sample from the score model that we have just learned. Then it will provide approximate samples from the data distribution. However, before applying score based genetic modeling to real world data distributions, we first need to deal with several complexities. First, scores may be undefined, either when the support of the data distribution is on a low dimensional manifold or when the data distribution is discrete. In both cases, we can make scores well defined by any noise. Suppose we end Gaussian noise, then the support of noise perturbed data distribution can cover the whole space and the noise perturbed data distribution becomes continuous. The following figure shows that it is critical for the success of a score estimation in practice to end noise. The left figure shows the loss curve when we train a deep score model on CIFA-10 images. Without any perturbation, the loss curve fails to converge and training is unstable. The right curve shows what happens when we add small Gaussian noise to the CIFA-10 images, in which case the loss goes down nicely and the training is more stable. Note that we perturb the data with a very small amount of Gaussian noise with variance 0.001, which is very small compared to the range of pixel value, which is between 0 and 1. Score estimation can also be inaccurate in regions of a low data density. To illustrate this fact, let's consider a mixture of Gaussian distribution. The left figure shows the density, the middle figure shows the data scores, and the right figure shows the estimated scores. Comparing middle and right figures, we can see that score estimation is only accurate in regions of high density close to the two modes. In regions of low data density, unfortunately, score estimation is not very accurate. Why can this happen? Recall that the objective for score estimation is equivalent to the Fisher divergence. When estimating the objective with ID samples, it only considers the square difference between data and model scores averaged over samples from the data distribution. Therefore, for high density regions where a lot of samples are available, score estimation can be more accurate, but in low data density regions where we do not know the samples, score estimation do not have enough information to be accurate. We can alleviate the problem again by adding noise. Suppose we add a huge amount of noise. Those noise can fill in low data density regions and provide samples almost everywhere to assist the score estimation. The following figure shows that score estimation is accurate almost everywhere under a suitable perturbation. However, there is a trade-off between sample quality and the accuracy of score estimation when we decide how, how much noise we want to end. Let's return to the mixture of Gaussian distribution. Without any perturbation, the data scores are not affected, but the uh, score estimation is inaccurate in low data density regions. Here in the rightmost figure, red color encodes uh, estimation error. Now we add noise to the data. The red color in the middle figure now depicts the difference between perturbed data score and the original data score. When noise is very small, the perturbed data scores are close to the original data scores, but the estimated scores are still inaccurate. Now consider any larger and larger noise. In this case, score estimation becomes accurate enough. However, the perturbed data scores also become further away from the original data score, which will result in worse sample quality. Can we achieve both high sample quality and high accuracy of score estimation at the same time? We propose to leverage the information from all levels of perturbation. More specifically, we sample from each perturbed distribution and use the samples to do score estimation. The most naive way of doing this, we require training a large number of separate score models independently, which can be costly. In contrast, we propose a conditional score network to jointly learn the scores for all perturbation levels. We call this network noise conditional score network. How can we sample from a noise conditional score network? Our method is called annual dynamics. 
which the basic idea is to use linear dynamics to sample from each perturbed distribution sequentially. More specifically, we first use linear dynamics to sample from the most perturbed distribution. The resulting samples will be used as an initialization for sampling from the next level. We continue in this fashion, and finally, we use linear dynamics to sample from the least perturbed distribution, which will become final samples for our noise conditional score network. This animation shows the sampling procedure of annual linear dynamics on several image sets. As you can see from the animation, we can start from random noise and follow the direction of scores to get nice looking samples. For CIFA 10 dataset, we also report the inception score and FRD score for samples from our model. Noticeably, we achieve a state of the art inception score for all condition generation for CIFA 10 images. In addition to sampling, we can also do impatting for arbitrarily occluded images. Here is a facial image. Here is the same image where the right half is missing. We can generate diverse and realistic impatings. And same for some other facial images as well. In conclusion, score based genetic modeling have many advantages. First, there is no need for the score model to be normalized or invertible. Therefore, we have a higher degree of flexibility in choosing the architecture for the score model. Second, there is no minimax optimization, so the training is uh, stable compared to GANs. And the loss function can also be used as a natural measurement of training progress or can be used to compare different models on the same dataset. We also found that uh, any noise and annual the noise levels are critical to the success of a score based genetic modeling in um, genetic modeling tasks in practice. And finally, our experiments also demonstrate that this new method has the potential in outperforming GANs in terms of sample quality. Thanks for your attention, and I hope to see you in the post session tonight. We have time for a few questions. Please use the microphones. Um, and would the spotlight, first five spotlight presenters please line up in order on this side? Uh, I have a technical question, actually. And here, this side. Hello. Hi. So basically, my, my wow, there's a lot of echo here. My, my question is about your parametrization. So how can you guarantee that you, get, you learn a conservative vector field? Um, well, basically, it's a criticism, because I think the right way to do it is to parameterize the energy function and then take the gradient of it. And you know, there is a paper called Deep Energy Asymmetry Networks, and there is a paper called Neural Empirical Bayes, and more body of work that they do exactly that. Yeah, so the question was, uh, the requirement for the score function is that it should be some derivative of a scalar function so that the curve of the score function must be zero. And uh, uh, in our case, we do not try to enforce this condition explicitly because the score matching objective doesn't require the score model to have this property. So theoretically, if we can minimize the score matching objective and assume the model is well specified, then we automatically achieve this property. But in practice, we may not achieve property, but this does not affect the fact that it's still a good approximation to the true scores. And uh, in practice, it doesn't seem to affect the result of a sampling using it. But don't you agree that the right way is to parameterize the energy function? Uh, can you repeat? Be don't yeah. you agree that the right way is to parameterize the energy function? Because you can use exactly what you did. Exactly. But just first parameterize the energy function and pass the gradient to your objective. I think that seems like the right way to do. Yeah, so uh, you can also do that, actually. And uh, uh, I believe someone has achieved success in doing that. Just parameterize the score model with the gradient of energy function, and you can also get some more quality very high, like uh, in several score over eight. Yes, that is also possible, but in our case, we didn't try that. And uh, There are like yeah. three, four works that you haven't cited, just saying. What? All right. Let's thank the speaker again. We're going to move on to the spotlight presentations. Hi. 
My name is Alex Heklushin, and in the following minutes, I will introduce our work about learning hierarchical priors in VAEs. The classical version autoencoder often leads to an overregularized latent representation due to the standard normal prior distribution. Therefore, we use a hierarchical model, hierarchical prior in our method, which leads or which extends the VE to a two layer stochastic model. To train this model, we apply a constraint optimization approach inspired by the work in taming VAEs. This animation shows one of our results. On the right side, you see the learned two dimensional latent representation of human motion data in form of a K nearest neighbors graph. And on the left side, you see the decoded interpolation along the latent manifold, denoted by the red line. And the smooth interpolation shows, and that's the important point here, that the learned latent representation matches the data manifold. Now, let's have a closer look at the results or at the details of our method. In the, in the context of VAEs, it is a desired ability to control the reconstruction quality. The reason is this allows to balance reconstruction and compression penalties. Therefore, the authors of Taming VAE formulated the VAE problem as a constraint optimization problem, where they defined the KL divergence as the optimization objective and the reconstruction error related term in the negative log likelihood as, const as constraint. However, the problem of over regularizing the latent representation still exists because, in order to learn complex latent representation, the model needs a flexible prior distribution. And the idea is, or the goal is, to learn this prior distribution. We know that the optimal empirical base prior is the aggregated posterior. And in order to express it, we use a hierarchical model where the parameters are learned by applying an importance weighted lower bound on the optimal empirical base prior, so the aggregated posterior. If we now insert this lower bound into the KL from the previous slide, we obtain the following Lagrange objective, where F is the lower bound on log PZ. As a result, we arrive to the optimization problem which mainly has two, three steps. In the first step, we update the lower bound on the empirical base prior, and the other two steps can, de, can be imp, interpreted as the corresponding steps of the original EM algorithm for training VAEs. Further details we will provide at our poster. Among other experiments, we compared our model to the importance weighted autoencoder. Both of these latent representations are sampled or generated by the prior distribution, by the respective prior distribution. And afterwards, the samples are connected to the k-nearest neighbors to obtain a graph, which allows us to interpolate between different data points in latent space. The results show that the hierarchical prior led to much smoother interpolation uh, movements, or more realistic movements. The blue boxes mark abrupt changes in the movement. And this indicates that our model learned a latent representation that matches the data manifold. We did a similar experiment with more complex data, 3D faces. Here, a higher dimensional latent space was necessary. And the interpolation show that the, or better the, the interpolation go along the latent manifold in case of the hierarchical prior. And on the other hand, if the model doesn't only have a standard normal prior distribution, it often cannot learn such a latent representation. So thank you very much for the attention and would like to see would love to see you at our at our poster 153. Hi, I'm going to pre present our work today on uh, using energy-based models to generate high-resolution images, as well as intriguing properties of energy-based models. Energy-based models are a class of generative models that were popular in the past, but have become less popular recently due to difficulty training. An energy-based model represents the likelihood that, of data through the Boltzmann distribution by assigning a real, ener uh, real values energy to each data point. Uh, the model is trained to decrease the energy of real data while increasing the energy of samples from the model distribution. To sample from the model distribution, we use uh, Langevin dynamics, a form of stochastic and, uh, optimization. 
so compared to other generative models, energy-based model generative models have a couple benefits. First, they're very flexible, as the model simply needs to output a single real energy. Furthermore, the model is able to both output a density as well as in and generate samples. Uh, since uh, generating samples just requires to cast out optimization, we can compose several different energy functions t uh, together, and we can also start the optimization for a generic image uh, and use a, a uh, adaptive amount of computation time. Furthermore, we show some intriguing properties in both robustness and online learning. Uh, so to, to make energy-based models uh, uh, work better, we uh, use adapt a, uh, adapt a series of things to more modern, modern deep learning practices. We use continuous gradient-based sampling. We use a replay buffer of past samples. And we also have a series of stability improvements, such as constrained Lipschitz constant and smoother activations. Uh, so starting from random noise, we're able to generate high resolution 128 by 128 conditional ImageNet images uh, through a, a refinement process. Uh, compared to other generative models, we find that energy-based models uh, are cheaper to train than flow-based or autoregressive models while being more expensive than GAN-based models. Uh, and here are some additional one conditional 128 by 128 images. Uh, so if we, take, if we take a trained conditional energy-based model and initialize it with an image from a different class, we're able to use sampling to, uh, to make that image into, the new, into a new class. My favorite example is if you input a truck into a frog energy function, it's able to make a frog truck. Uh, so energy-based models have a series of surprising benefits. One is robustness. Uh, curiously, when uh, both autoregressive and flow-based models are trained on the CIFAR-10 data set, they actually assign higher likelihood to the S uh, SVHN data set. In contrast, we find that energy-based models actually assign lower likelihood to the SVHN data set. Uh, we, use a, we evaluate on a series of different data, other data sets using extensive methods and find that energy-based models produce uh, perform well in all of those scenarios. Similarly, we find that our robustness carries over to classification. We can train different conditional energy functions to assign energies to each class and use the lowest energy class as a classification result. We find that this is very robust uh, to adversarial perturbations and actually performs better at high adversarial perturbations in PGD-based training. Uh, the caveat is our accuracy is a bit lower, but a, fa uh, but a follow-up submission from someone else on iClear improves the baseline energy EBM performance to that of baselines by adding a classifier. Uh, we also find energy-based models perform well in continual learning. We evaluate this using the split MNAS test, where we're given uh, first 0, 1 labels, then 2, 3 labels, and so forth. We, uh, ex existing evaluation found that uh, other approaches attain around 20% on this. We find that EBM is able to get 64% on this task, uh, while a generative model gets around 40%. Uh, energy, EBMs also exhibit compositionality. For example, this diagram shows that by adding energy A and energy B, you get energy A and plus B. This carries over to high resolution images such as faces and sh attributes of shapes. Uh, for example, you first have an EBM for the young attribute, you add female, uh, and then you add smiling, and then you get wavy here to get a series. Um, and these EBMs are separately trained. Finally, the EBMs work not only for images, but also in the trajectory domain. Uh, by using that EBM to model pairwise state transitions, uh, we can add additional reward factors to make inference a form of reinforcement learning on the objective. Uh, we find that on a, a series of different tasks, we are able to perform well using this, uh, especially in the online scenario. Uh, all our code is online, and uh, feel free to come by our poster session if you have additional questions. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so this work is about uh, designing invertible convolutional flows. Uh, uh, the main challenges in uh, normalizing flow is to design invertible, flexible transformations which scale uh, with a scalable inversion and uh, Jacobian uh, determinant computation, which is uh, an active research subject. We, pro we propose two ways to improve expressivity of these flows. We first uh, consider invertible convolutional uh, filters, and uh, uh, then uh, we will design invertible nonlinear gates uh, analytically. So if, we, uh, if the signal is padded cyclically, we will obtain uh, the circular convolution 
the Jacobian of uh, this form of the convolution uh, is a circulant matrix, which can be diagonalized using the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, a nice property of this, uh, this convolution is that there is a uh, convolution, multipli uh, convolution multiplication property which enables performing the convolution and its inverse uh, in the frequency domain. And these computations enjoy the fast uh, implementation uh, of DFT called the fast Fourier transform. As you see, the cyclic expansion shown in this picture uh, can cause discontinuity at the boundaries of the signal. So uh, we might need to use a smooth expansion instead in, uh, in some applications, such as the even symmetric expansion that is uh, shown here. Based on this expansion, the symmetric convolution is defined as first expand both the signal and the kernel of the convolution symmetrically and then apply the circular convolution on them. Again, the convolution multiplication property holds for this uh, form of transformation, which implies that the convolution, its Jacobian determinant and inverse uh, transform can be, uh, can be performed efficiently uh, using the fast Fourier transform uh, algorithm again. So based on this invertible convolution, we can design highly flexible flows by allowing the convolution kernel to adapt to the input. So uh, if we uh, split the input x into this joint part, x1 and x2, and convolving the first half by uh, an arbitrary function of the second half, we will obtain uh, a data adaptive convolution that, is, uh, uh, that will be an invertible convolution if we use one of those uh, convolution that we uh, defined before. And it has a scalable inversion and determinant Jacobian computation. The second way uh, in which we improve uh, the expressivity of normalizing flow is that we observe that the log determinant Jacobian uh, term in the log likelihood can be viewed as a regularizer. So if there are some uh, properties such as sparsity that we would like to encourage in uh, intermediate layers of a flow-based model, we can do so by carefully designing the nonlinear gates. So the nonlinear gate we showed that uh, can be obtained by solving this uh, differential equation. As an uh, example, if we want to induce a sparsity uh, on the intermediate uh, activations, this can be done uh, by uh, using this uh, symmetric log uh, form uh, nonlinear gate that is de depicted in this uh, slide. And we uh, obtain this uh, analytically. So combining all of these components together, the element-wise uh, multiplication and the uh, 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 the, uh, the data adaptive convolution and the pointwise nonlinear gate that we uh, correspond to the sparsity regularizer in the coupling, for, coupling form, uh, uh, we will introduce the, uh, a flow called convolutional uh, coupling flow. And we apply that to convolutional, uh, we apply this uh, flow to a variety of uh, data set and uh, it performs very well. So come see our poster for more details and results. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ricky, and I'm here to talk about uh, residual flows. Uh, this is a framework that lets us build powerful generative models, uh, trainable with maximum likelihood using simple residual networks. Uh, this is a joint work with Jens, David, and Jorn. So residual networks are easy to implement, uh, and they're extremely flexible. You specify a neural network as G, and you do X plus G of X to compute the output. Uh, the invertible resonant paper by Behrman et al. showed that if you constrain G to have Lipschitz less than 1, uh, a residual connection is always uh, invertible. Not analytically, but in the sense that there exists a unique solution for the inverse 
uh, which can be found using fixed point iteration. Okay. So with the invertibility condition satisfied, we can now apply the change of variables formula. Uh, unfortunately, if we apply the series residual transformations, we end up with an infinite series for computing the log likelihood. Uh, but note that if we train using stochastic gradient descent with maximum likelihood, uh, we don't actually need to e exactly compute the log likelihood, right? We only need a stochastic unbiased estimate of the gradient of the log likelihood. Okay. So the keyword there was unbiased, and the approach we take is quite general. It's appropriately named the Russian roulette estimator. Uh, suppose we want to uh, estimate an infinite sum. We always compute the first term, then we flip a coin. Uh, if it returns the value 1, we'll stop evaluating. If it returns the value 0, we'll keep evaluating, but we upweight the remaining terms by a factor of 1 over 1 minus q. Uh, the reason being, uh, when we take the expectation, this reweighting cancels out with the probability of this outcome. Okay. Um, and to take this even further, oh, sorry. Uh, so, okay, but something interesting has happened here, right? So, this estimator, when we want to compute it, there's a probability of Q that we only need an, a finite amount of time, right? It's a very simple estimator. But we can take this idea and recursively apply it over and over again to the remaining terms, right? Sampling a new coin toss for every outcome where we have to continue. Right? Now, the final result is an unbiased estimator for the log likelihood that uses finite compute with probability one. Uh, here we directly sample the first successful coin toss and then re -up, uh, upweight each term appropriately by the number of failed coins to uh, coin tosses that would take to get there. Right. We call this a residual flow because it is now a flow based model that has the benefit of being trainable with maximum likelihood. Okay. okay, so here we see that if we use a biased estimate of the negative log likelihood, so this is something that we want to minimize, uh, the estimate gets lower throughout training, but the real objective is much higher, the red uh, solid line. This is because we end up optimizing for the bias, and we're not optimizing the actual objective. And using the unbiased estimator lets us train properly, but the biggest downside with training with this estimator is that it uses variable memory. Uh, this means if we ever sample enough terms to run out of memory, training stops. Right? We don't want to be doing rejecting sampling or anything that would bias the optimization either. Uh, so instead, we're going to analytically differentiate and use an alternative power series representing the gradient of the log likelihood. Then we see that the gradient operator never shows up in the series itself and only appears once outside the series. What this means is we can uh, directly estimate the gradient of this log likelihood with the Russian roulette estimator and still use constant amount of memory regardless of the sample n. It's very nice. Uh, in addition to these contributions, we also introduced this lip swish activation function. Uh, it's basically a modifi modification of the swish activation function. We motivate it because it has non saturating derivatives. Uh, using these, we were able to outperform nearly every existing flow based model uh, with uniform dequantization on standard benchmark data sets. Most notably, without the unbiased estimator, um, even on CFR 10 with a large network, the true log likelihood doesn't converge uh, and covers around the rather large uh, value of bits per din. Uh, the unbiased estimator lets us train with large networks, and using the lip swish activation uh, further improves the gradient flow, lets us achieve better performance. Okay, so, on the qualitative side, we do find that our samples are a bit more globally coherent compared to other general models that are trained with maximum likelihood. We also reported FID scores in the paper, um, and to show that we can scale up to large networks and high dimensional data, we ran experiments on images of size 255, uh, sorry, 256 uh, by 256, uh, which absolutely required the unbiased estimator as well as the memory efficient backpropagation. Uh, so finally, we've released code as well as the pre-trained models. I would like to thank my co-authors, Jens, David, and Jorn, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Chao Yu Fu, and uh, this is a joint work with Xiang, Yibo, Huaibo, and my advisor, Ran He. Face images acquired from different sources take, um, present diverse modalities. Some special modalities include uh, NR faces taken by near infrared sensors and uh, thermal faces taken by thermal infrared sensors. Matching faces across different modalities raises the task of heterogeneous face recognition which is broadly 
used in many practical applications. For example, since the near-infrared sensors are less sensitive to visible illumination variants, they are um, widely equipped to many mobile phones for face recognition. However, heterogeneous face recognition remains a challenge problem. The first challenge is the large domain gap between heterogeneous state. For instance, uh, the face recognition model trained on the visible data often degrade on the near infrared data. And the second challenge is the lack of large scale databases due to the difficulty in data collection. As a result, the models trained on small scale databases often tend to overfit. Recently, the great progress of generative model has made recognition Y generation possible. Previous methods often adopt conditional image synthesis manner. It, uh, it uh, reduces the domain gap by translating um, uh, um, faces from one modality to the other one, such as translating near infrared faces to the visible faces. Um, differently, we propose an unconditional image synthesis manner, which generates images from noise. For the conditional image synthesis methods, there are two potential challenge. The first one is diversity. Given one image, a generator only synthesizes one new, new image of the target domain. It means that such image-to-image -image translation methods can only generate a limited number of images. At the same time, the image before and after translation have the same attributes, such as the pose and the expression, uh, leading to limited intra-class diversity. And the second challenge is consistency. When generating large-scale databases, it is a challenge to guarantee the identity of the generated images. Um, to take care of the above challenges, we propose an unconditional DR variational generation framework. It generates large-scale paired heterogeneous state with abandoned intra-class diversity from noise. Furthermore, it only pays attention to the identity consistency of the generated paired heterogeneous state rather than the identity who the generated images belong to. Particularly, we propose a DR variational autoencoder to learn a joint distribution of the paired heterogeneous state, and uh, in order to constrain the identity consistency of the generated paired heterogeneous state, we impose both a distribution, in the, a distribution alignment in the latent space and a pairwise identity preserving in the image space. And in the test phase, we sample large-scale paired heterogeneous state from noise to reduce the domain gap in the recognition network. In the IR VRS recognition task, by using our method, the performance of baseline is significantly improved. We get the state-of-the-art results on these databases. And in the other heterogeneous phase recognition task, we also observe significant improvements. If you are interested in our work, please come to our post. Thank you for your listening. Let's thank all the uh, Spotlight presenters one more time. Our second oral presentation uh, is going to be presented, uh, co-presented by Sharon Zhu and Mitchell Gordon. Uh, the title is Hype, a benchmark for human eye perceptual evaluation of generative models. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharon. I'm Mitchell. And this is joint work with Ranjay Krishna and Austin Narcomi with faculty advisors Fei-Fei Li and Michael Bernstein. I want to start off by asking you, which model is better? the one that generated the images on the right or on the left. Maybe you think the model on the right is better, but how much better? And how do we measure this? Being able to say that one model is better than another, evaluating models is critical to measuring progress in any field. And across generative models, we've been able to improve them over time. And this is taken from Ian Goodfellow's Twitter. Um, but how do we distinguish between models with differences that are harder to pick up on automatically and continue to measure this progress over time, especially when those samples are not necessarily paired? In this talk, we introduce hype, 
human eye perceptual evaluation to measure this progress. By having crowds of people like yourselves look at images like you just did and evaluate how realistic they are and aggregating these measurements in such a way that they're consistent, efficient, and grounded in theory. We make hype available online at a click of a button. Simply upload your generated samples to an S3 bucket, enter your keys, and receive your hype score. And your hype score will look something like this, where uh, your hype score essentially determines how realistic your generated samples are between 0 and 100. And these are the scores for the two models that you saw before. OK, so now you might ask, why not use automated metrics? Density estimation, when it's available, has shown to be misleading. Automated metrics that look at sampled output rely heavily on ImageNet embeddings, and that's not ideal when we're not using ImageNet and looking at human faces, for example. OK, but haven't we used human evaluation before? Yes, but human evaluation metrics are neither consistent nor efficient nor grounded in theory. In fact, many of us researchers are dismayed that when we do run human evaluation, we get this figure on the right with huge error bars of, that are overlapping, where it's hard to distinguish which model is actually better than another. So in summary, human evaluation metrics historically have been ad hoc with high variance, as we see in this figure, leaking, leading to a lack of clear separability between models, and finally, expensive and time consuming. Our goal was to create a human evaluation metric that solves these problems. Hype addresses these criteria by measuring perceptual fidelity of generated output using psychophysics methods grounded in perceptual psychology. Hype is reliable across different samples from the same model. Hype is uh, able to statistically separate different models to enable a com comparative ranking between a good model and a great model. And finally, hype is cost and time efficient. So let's discuss how we're going to go from this, a model's output of generated images, to a single score of perceptual realism. So what task did I give you to evaluate a model's output? Well, here's an image. I could tell you that this is either real or fake. It's from a training set. Or, well, real or fake, um, if it's real it's from a training set. Uh, and I could just ask you to stare at this for a while, but we only have 12 minutes in this talk, so I'm going to give you the answer. This is fake. It's generated from StyleGAN. Uh, and that's a fun task, but it seems pretty arbitrary. So to make a gold standard metric, we wanted to start by grounding our task in established scientific methods that have been proven to be effective. And so in this talk, we're going to introduce two variants of hype. First, I'm going to show you how we derive hype from research in psychophysics. Uh, then I'm going to show how we can ablate that method and remove time limits to recreate its results more efficiently using modern crowdsourcing techniques. So let's start with hype time. As I mentioned, we've grounded hype time in a method from psychophysics, which is the study of the relation between a stimulus and someone's reaction to that stimulus. Uh, methods from psychophysics have been used by computer vision researchers for some time now, often aimed at learning which aspects of a scene people understand from a glance. Uh, and one of the core methods in the psychophysics toolbox is the adaptive staircase procedure. Um, staircase methods are able to efficiently and reliably identify human perceptual thresholds, or the amount of time that a human needs to perceive something. Uh, they've been used to, for instance, estimate the amount of time that a human needs to look at a scene to perform levels of scene categorization. And our insight is that we can actually use an adaptive staircase procedure to evaluate the perceptual realism of generative or generated images. The longer someone needs to look at an image from a generative model to tell that it's fake, then the better that model is. So now let me give you an intuition for how hype instantiates this staircase by walking you through it. So here we're going to plot the exposure length or the amount of time that we show each image over successive images. Um, and over time, as we get images right or wrong, this staircase is going to ascend or descend and eventually converge to uh, a perceptual threshold. So here's our starting exposure. So this is going to happen quickly, so pay close attention. Here we go. So first, you'll notice that right after the image, we quickly showed a series of blurry images. These are called perceptual masks, uh, and we showed those to prevent further sensory processing after the image disappears. Um, OK, so what do we think? Was that real or fake? Well, I'm going to guess it was fake, and looks like I was right. Uh, so, so what next? Well, staircases often work in a one-up, two-down procedure, meaning that we get two corrects in a row before we descend the staircase. 
So let's say I do another one at 500 milliseconds, and let's say I get that one right. So now we would descend the staircase. And let's say we get a couple more right. We would descend again down to 250. So let's try one there. A bit harder, right? Um, and let's say I got that one right. And then let's, we do another one at 250. And let's say I get that right. And now we go down to 125 milliseconds. And that one's really hard. Um, so let's say I got that one wrong. So now we're going to ascend the staircase back up to 250 milliseconds. And then the idea here is that if we do this with enough images, we're going to converge to a point where the exposure time stays roughly at the same place, which is going to be the minimum time needed for each evaluator to correctly label images. It's producing what is known as the psychometric function or the relationship of time stimulus to expo or time stimulus accuracy um, to exposure. And then for each evaluator, our perceptual threshold is just the modal exposure time. Uh, from three staircases in a row, or three blocks. And then we get our final hype score by taking the mean of the perceptual thresholds from 30 evaluators. So we'll get into more results later, but just quickly, this means that we might get a threshold of 240 milliseconds for style GAN without the truncation trick, or 360 mil 363 milliseconds for style GAN with the truncation trick. Um, and so that means that it takes people longer to be able to accurately classify style GAN with the truncation trick, which indicates that that model has higher perceptual realism. So we now have this gold standard benchmark that's grounded in psychophysics. But unfortunately, it's slow. It requires 450 images, uh, at least an hour per evaluator, and it's expensive at $360 per eval. And so we then ask, can we create a faster, cheaper benchmark that produces the same rankings by ablating it? So now I'm going to shift from hype time and introduce hype infinity. So going back to our original task, how can we ablate this? Uh, well, we remove the time limits. And so this means that we give evaluators unlimited time to view an image. So the process is we show an image for unlimited time. The evaluator gives their answer. The evaluator repeats that a number of times. And instead of a perceptual threshold, we measure a deception rate, or simply a calculation of the accuracy over 50 real and 50 fake images. Um, but we have a problem. So the staircase method was slow because it required many images to converge to reach a reasonable variance within an evaluator. But it reduced the variance across multiple evaluators. Our ablated method is fast. It requires fewer images to converge and reduce variance within an evaluator. But the variance was high across multiple evaluators, which led to inconsistent aggregated scores. And so how can we reduce the variance across evaluators? Well, this is where we draw on modern crowdsourcing techniques. Now, to bring down the between evaluator variance, we took our new variant of hype time, or of hype, a task that we arrived at um, by ablating the original staircase method, and then updated it by applying a number of techniques from the modern crowdsourcing literature, including uh, gated instruction, person based filtering, performance based incentives. Um, and then, with those techniques, we were able to reduce the between evaluator's variance and get a tighter estimate. Um, and again, we'll get into more results later, but this means that for an advanced model like StyleGAN with truncation trick, 27.6% of images are judged incorrectly. And as a reminder, 50% would, uh, would be when people could not distinguish real from fake. OK, so we now have these two variants. We have hype time, a gold standard benchmark, and a class or grounded in a classic psychophysics procedure. Uh, and we have hype infinity, an ablated version of hype time that optimizes for speed and cost. And our goal with Hype Infinity was to take the ranking of generative models that we got from our gold standard benchmark, a method inspired by classic psychophysics procedure with roots in the 1940s, and then reproduce that ranking more cheaply by ablating that method and then applying modern crowdsourcing techniques. And I'm going to throw it back to Sharon to talk about how we evaluated Hype. So we evaluated Hype on several canonical data sets. Uh, including the Celebay data set of human faces, the higher resolution FFHQ data set, uh, some image data sets, CIFAR 10, and five different classes in ImageNet, some easy and some difficult historically for generative models. We also look at some of the most popular and influential GANs across the years, including WGAN GP, BGAN, ProGAN, StyleGAN, SNGAN, and BigGAN. We also experiment uh, style with, the, with different sampling techniques with and without the truncation trick on StyleGAN and BigGAN as presented in their respective papers. And I'll focus uh, uh, the results section on uh, Celebe and FFHQ in this talk. So uh, Hype inf Infinity and Hype Time were able to rank the GANs consistently on Celebe and on FFHQ. Um, and again, these were the models uh, style GAN with and without the truncation trick that you saw before at the beginning of this talk. And instead of overlapping confidence intervals, Hype was able to separate models quite well. 
Intuitively, hype also has an interesting hyper-realism threshold at 50, which means that the generated output actually looks more realistic than real images when, when seen together. And StyleGAN has been able to achieve this with the truncation trick on Celebay, but not necessarily on FFHQ. So in summary, hype is grounded. We built it off of psychophysics literature. Hype is reliable, as you saw, with a cons consistent ranking of GANs. Uh, hype is separable. It's able to um, uh, essentially have great confidence intervals. Um, and finally, hype is efficient, costing only uh, $60. Uh, costing only $60 and taking as few as 30 minutes for a single model. Uh, hype is a success, successful metric for perceptual fidelity on generative models, but it doesn't look at sample diversity. And diversity is important because you can imagine a case where we generate one single very real image but nothing else. Um, or more commonly, mode collapse. Uh, so diversity is very, very important. Hype is limited only to images right now, uh, but we hope to extend it to other modalities such as text. We're really excited to be open sourcing Hype uh, and releasing it in such a way that researchers can simply upload their samples to an S3 bucket, click a button, and receive their Hype score. The goal is to make this system extremely easy to use without any of the plumbing that we did in this paper. So thank you so much, and please learn more at hype.stanford.edu. All right, again, we have time for a few questions. Please use the microphones, and Spotlight presenters, uh, please line up in order here. Hi, uh, my name's Jesse. That was a really cool talk. Um, I think it's probably true that more image, like real images we looked at like on Instagram are actually being modified by machine learning or uh, maybe even GANs. Do you imagine that like our ability to perceive whether something is real and, and fake might be impacted um, by just seeing a lot more like edited videos and have you thought about how that might like play into a perceptual metric like this? Um, great question. Um, so yeah, one important component of this that we haven't really talked about is uh, the, the ecological validity, or essentially how this would work in, in the real world as the world becomes more and more saturated with things like GANs. Um, and this metric as it stands right now, yes, it requires that people have some baseline of understanding of what real is and what is not. And so as people sort of, as, as their minds become more adjusted to certain things, and that's going to change the scores. Um, so this method is not trying to address that problem, but we agree it's important to think about the ecological validity. If you have anything to add. Thank you. So my, my question is, I was a little confused about whether, the, whether hype is, is currently crowdsourced or whether it runs automatically, like it's a neural network or something? Uh, so perhaps a little bit of both. Uh, it'll run at a click of a button, but it deploys essentially a crowdsourcing system. So, so, so once a researcher um, gives their S3 credentials, those images are then crowdsourced to whoever? Yes, Mechanical Turk. To a Mechanical Turk. And mm -hmm. So you, you said in average it takes about 30 minutes to get a, resco a score back for, for an arbitrary? Yes, that would be as fast as 30 minutes. Uh, it would deploy something called a container system. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Uh, very exciting work. Um, when you're talking about uh, extending this to um, other modalities, one thing I was thinking about is, do you see any way to apply this to, for example, to generative audio, where intuitively I see a, a challenge in uh, reducing the amount of time that the human's allowed to perceive an image versus perceive an audio clip? Or do you see there uh, being no challenges there? 
Uh, so it'll likely be m more expensive because it probably takes longer um, for us to perceive audio to be realistic or not. Um, and audio probably, um, depending on your application, it might, it might be less about realism and about subjectivity. All right, any, ex any other questions, please find the authors at their poster. Thanks, and let's thank them again. All right, we have five more, five more spotlight presentations for the session. Hello. Hello, I'm Thomas. Uh, I'll present adaptive density estimation for generative models. And this is joint work with Constantine, Kartik, Cordelia, and Jacob. So the setting of generative modeling is you're given samples from a target distribution, P star, that you're trying to fit with a model, P theta. And there's two dominant ways to go about this. <clears throat> the first is maximum likelihood, where you take samples from the training set and you evaluate how well your model covers them. And the second is adversarial training, where this time you sample from the model and you evaluate the quality of these samples using a proxy to P star. And they behave differently in practice, so the one-dimensional illustration could be assume your data has two modes and your model only has one. Then a maximum likelihood will sample the gray crosses from the data set and push the model to cover them. And to do so, it'll have to go through the region of low density in the center. And the consequence is you get a model that covers the full support of the distribution but overgeneralizes to unrealistic samples. Adversarial training is complementary to that in some sense. It will sample the purple crosses from the model, and to avoid going through the low density region, it will push the model to drop part of the support. So you get high quality samples, but you fail to model all the variability in the data. So the goal of hybrid training would be to train with a richer training signal by explicitly optimizing both support coverage and sample quality. There's many ways you can view this, but one is if you're doing maximum likelihood, you don't want the mass of your density model to collapse to Dirac's on the training points, because that would just be overfitting. But you never explicitly evaluate where the off data set mass goes. You rely instead on regularization and inductive bias for the mass to go to meaningful places. Now with a discriminator, uh, you can see this as having a learnable inductive bias that you can use to evaluate where the mass goes. Another way to see this is uh, you have a GAN, but you retain an objective um, measure of support coverage in the form of likelihood on uh, unseen real data. There are some challenges. First, there's always going to be a trade-off between those two objectives. Think about the 1D example. Um, and so maybe to get the best of both worlds, you need increased model flexibility. Uh, another is that maximum likelihood typically makes limit, uh, parametric assumptions on the output density, such as Gaussianity and conditional independence. Um, and this can be problematic in a hybrid setting. So that's why existing hybrid models typically don't have a likelihood, um, don't rely on a likelihood in pixel space. So if you apply, uh, oh, so why is the conditional independence problematic? Um, say you have a latent variable Z and your model hits uh, the support and locally it looks like this and you make a conditional independence assumption. Uh, that means the level sets of your model will be diagonally aligned and adversarial training will try to squeeze uh, those level sets while maximum likelihood will try to spread them. So there is a conflict there. To avoid those strong parametric assumptions, uh, you will, uh, we lift reconstruction losses typically used in maximum likelihood into a feature space. And if this feature space is built using an invertible model, you can go back to image space and have a valid density there. You also need to retain fast sampling because it's mandatory for adversarial training. If you apply this to natural image, so you can go to a feature space, train a VAE there using the standard elbow but with feature targets, and you can go back to image space using the train of, uh, change of variable formula. And that gives you uh, a way to train the model with maximum likelihood. You can also sample from the latent space, transform this to an image sample, feed it to a trained discriminator to evaluate its quality. On Cypher, you can get, uh, by doing this, uh, compelling samples and models that are on par with good GANs in terms of inception statistics, while 
obtaining a competitive support, um, sorry, competitive likelihood on unseen data, which means you're not dropping part of the support. Uh, another thing you can do is you can train with this construction small models that fit on a single GPU at higher resolution and still get uh, compelling samples while again having uh, support guarantees in the form of likelihood on test data. Uh, yep, so we'll be presenting poster 71 later. Uh, and yeah, thanks for your attention. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to present our work from uh, from a paper to an auxiliary classifier GAN. Uh, as we all know, GAN learns a probability distributions from a given data set in an unsupervised manner. The discriminator competes, competes, with, competes against uh, the generator by a min max GAN, minimizing the JHD between the true data distribution and the generated data distribution. A conditional GAN allows the user to control the type of data generator through a use of the class label by adding the label information into both the generator and the discriminator. Um, the auxiliary class file GAN or AC GAN is one of the most popular type of conditional GAN. It is an additional uh, class file uh, which models the conditional parts. However, the data generated by the AC GAN tends to uh, suffer from low diversity and uh, approach it to the model class, especially for the data with a large number of classes. Here are two examples of the data generated by AC GAN. On the left, we can see an example of low diversity <coughs> uh, using the CIFAR 100 data. On the right, we can see the we can see an example of the complete model class using MGNet 1000 data. Are these problems just simply um, due to the high dimensionality of the data, or is this uh, the uh, inherent the problem of the AC gain? We can test this by a simple 1D toy experiment. Here we train an AC gain on a mixture of three 1D Gaussians. Each color represents a different class. The left image is the ground truth, and the right image is generated by the AC GAN. AC GAN does a pro job on modeling the overlap between classes, um, which gets worse um, as the overlap increases. This leads to the low variance, low diversity, and uh, more collapse. Let's take a look at the uh, uh, and how AC GAN works and uh, what causes this problem. A conditional GAN tries to learn a conditional distribution by matching two joint distributions, PXY the data and the QXY the model estimates. In AC GAN decomposes the joint distribution to a conditional one and a marginal distribution. The GAN part of the AC GAN matches the marginal distribution by minimizing their JSD. An auxiliary class file is introduced here, QCY given X, which estimates the conditional distribution from the data. The auxiliary class file minimizes the cross entropy loss between the predicted value and the, the true data labels. So, which is equivalent to minimize the KL divergence. This is because the conditional entropy of the data is a constant value. The same procedure is done again, uh, this time between the auxiliary class file and the estimated data labels. But the conditional entropy is not a conditional entropy of the estimated data distribution is not constant. And ignoring it uh, causes the um, same problem we saw previously. Because this conditional entropy is very hard to calculate, we propose the following solution. We want to maximize this conditional entropy of QY given X. Uh, this is equivalent to minimizing the mutual information. And uh, that is equivalent to minimizing the JSD between, um, between the conditional distribution 
from the estimated data for each class. Because we will introduce uh, another JSD, so we can just or we can just introduce another class file which operates on the estimated data to estimate the conditional entropy. Here you can see the schematic of our architecture. The class the, this class file competes with the generator, which we call it the twin classifier. If we go back to the to our toy experiment, we can see that our TSC model can easily reproduce the true distribution, even in the case of large number overlap. And even when we apply this model to high dimensional data, we no longer suffer from the low diversity and the tending toward model collapse. We've done extensive testing across different data sets, and uh, we have some quantitative results and comparisons with the projection gain. For more details in the results, please stop by our poster number 87. Thank you. OK, hi, I'm Josh Seskind, and I'll be giving a uh, talk on joint work from our Apple Research Group on adversarial Fisher vectors for unsupervised representation learning led by Shangfei, Zai, and co-authors Walter Talbot and Carlos Questron. So we motivate our paper oops, uh, using uh, from several important fundamental questions about GANs, um, and starting from the point that GANs uh, are trained with the objective of generating samples that um, are highly realistic uh, from a generator and uh, don't have an explicit encoding representation in their traditional form. So we first ask whether the discriminator of a trained GAN can be made useful at test time, uh, given that the discriminator is typically used as a critic to help, gener uh, to help train the generator. Second, we ask whether GANs learn useful representations of data that we can then harness for downstream tasks. And uh, furthermore, we ask whether we actually need an explicit encoder in order to get at this representation, or if we can find it in a more natural way. So to answer these questions, we start from the energy-based model interpretation of GANs, uh, which basically gives us a way to treat a GAN as a parameterized density model. And we start from the WGAN formulation, uh, where you can see in the inner loop, um, we minimize a particular objective function with respect to the discriminator. Uh, and in the outer loop, we maximize uh, this objective function with respect to the generator. In the EBM formulation, we plug in the discriminator term as a negative energy term. Uh, and we uh, treat the generator as a variational sampling distribution. And interestingly, the EBM formulation, if you write it out, turns out to have a dual form to a WGAN in the sense that uh, the objective function is the same uh, with the addition of an entropy term uh, for the generated samples to in encourage diversity. Um, and the minim minimization and maximization procedures for minimizing the discriminator and maximizing the generator are uh, reversed. Interestingly, since we use gradient descent, uh, these differences are essentially, uh, they go away in practice and the implementation. And so therefore we can train a GAN, uh, treat it as an EBM, and then we have a density model from which we can extract a representation if we have a method for extracting that representation. So that's where we turn to Fisher vectors, which is a classic method um, used in computer vision tasks um, for uh, providing a way to get a representation out of a probabilistic model. So Fisher vectors start by computing a Fisher score, which is the gradient of the log probability of this uh, data vector with respect to the model parameters. And uh, in practice, what you do is then normalize this score with uh, the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. And this intuitively gives a, um, a set of directions indicating how the model needs to change to better fit the particular data vector. So in this work, we extend the Fisher vector technique to GANs uh, by first training a GAN and then treating it as an EBM, as before. And then we compute the Fisher vector from the GAN representation uh, using the discriminator as a negative energy term, which gives us a Fisher score that corresponds to the gradient of the discriminator score with respect to real data. Um, and then we subtract off or baseline the uh, gradient uh, with respect to the generated samples. And the Fisher information is computed as the empirical Fisher uh, matrix, um, which is essentially the covariance of the gradients uh, 
for uh, the expectation of the covariance of the gradients with respect to uh, generated samples. So then we can use this Fisher vector that we obtain as a representation for downstream tasks, just like in the classic computer vision sense, uh, such as classification. So this is what we do. Um, and uh, we demonstrate that we achieve state-of-the-art results, um, very strong results, on an unsupervised learning uh, task, uh, benchmark task, on CIFAR-10. And uh, this task involves uh, extracting a representation from an unsupervised learning mechanism and then freezing the representation and then training a linear classifier on top. And the goal of this uh, exercise is to assess the quality of the representation itself. And so we compare it to several unsupervised learning and self-supervision methods uh, and show that our method um, is very strong, uh, operates, uh, works very well, and as we increase the capacity of the model and as well as increase the data, um, both the samples um, from, again, will get better and our uh, method uh, works, works even better in classification. So that and, and, uh, encroaches upon the uh, supervised learning benchmark using the same architecture. So basically what this means in practice is that we can train a really good density model with uh, again and extract a representation for other downstream tasks. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Adam Bielski and I will present this work by me and Professor Paolo Favaro on unsupervised object segmentation. So in object segmentation, we want to get for real images this precise pixel level information where an object is. However, for most of the methods, this requires uh, a lot of annotated data, this pairs of annotated images, which are, require human labor, labor are expensive to obtain, often require expertise knowledge. So we propose a method to do it in an unsupervised way without annotations. So we want to learn this encoder-decoder segmentation model, and our first step to do that is we want to learn a generative model that will produce this layered rep representation of a scene, namely a background, a foreground with an object, and a mask for this object. Once we have that, we can mask the foreground and the background uh, to create this composite image of the whole scene. And we want to train a generative adversarial network so that this composite image looks uh, real, like this unlabeled real images that we have. However, if we do just that, we have no guarantee that we will learn meaningful representation. For example, we could get a lot of degenerate solutions, such as we could have part of the object generated in the background, part in the foreground, foreground and have the composite image look real. We could have the same Im image generated in the background and the foreground, and then whatever the mask is, the composite image will look real. We could have an empty mask and have the whole scene generated in the background. But we want to get to this good solution where we have good separation between background and the foreground and a good mask. So how can we detect these bad solutions? Let's consider here these two uh, segmentations, the one on the right, which is correct, and the one, uh, the one on the left, which is not. It has some parts of the background and not the whole object. And let's see what happens if we uh, apply some small shift to these regions. And we can notice that if the segmentation is correct, then the resulting scene will still look real. However, if it's not, it doesn't look real, doesn't look like, like real data. And this is our way to detect if the segmentation was uh, correct or not. So we can see here that in the first two cases, uh, the composite image after shifting the um, uh, object doesn't look real, and the discriminator of a gun should easily de detect that. There is still a problem with an empty mask, but we can just add a loss term to avoid such solutions, and we are left with this good segmentation. So we apply that. We use this loss term on a mask to avoid empty masks, and apply some small random shift to the foreground and the mask. It's a shift that the generator is not aware of, and we create a composite image with this randomly shifted objects, and then train the GAN so that the composite image looks real. 
so this is some of the results that we obtained, trained on four data sets. From the top, it's generated background, foreground, and the mask. On the very bottom, generated composite image. And we can see that we are able to get this good separation between background and the foreground, and quite precise masks for the objects. Now that we have our generative model, we want to uh, learn to segment real images. And what we do is we freeze our trained generator. And we want to uh, train an encoder that is able to learn to map from real image to a latent code that produces this layered representation. And we train it in a way that the composite image looks like our input image. Once we do that, we can just use the mask from our layered representation and use this as a segmentation. So we did that. Here we can see some examples of the segmentation. Uh, in many cases, it works well. In some, it still doesn't work well, which is a result of some ambiguities in training this encoder. So this is it. Thank you for your attention. If you want to know more, please talk to us at poster number 60. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan. I'm going to tell you about work with co-authors Evan Lone and Peter Abiel on how to turn a flow model into a, a lossless compression algorithm. So lossless compression is this problem of taking data drawn from some data distribution and turning it into a binary string, which is as short as possible, while still, still guaranteeing that it can be recovered by some decoder exactly. So the way to do this, this is a very well-studied problem. The way to do this is to train a likelihood-based generative model, P of x, using maximal likelihood, and then construct a code which achieves these code lengths very close to negative log P of x. So maximal likelihood will optimize the expected code length of this hypothetical code. And if you do this very well, then this will approach the entropy of the data, which is the best that any lossless compression algorithm can do. But we know this code exists. But for it to be practical, it needs to be computationally efficient. So unfortunately, naively trying to come up with this code takes resources that scale exponentially with the dimension of the data. These, these naive ways of constructing codes basically require enumer enumerating all possible data points, which is not possible to do. So to make an efficient compression algorithm, we have to make assumptions about the structure of the generative model. So for autoregressive models, this is well known. The idea is to code one dimension of the data at a time using an algorithm like arithmetic coding or asymmetric numeral systems. And this works very well. With latent variable models like VAEs, where you have this approximate posterior, there is a procedure called bits back coding, which achieves a code length which is very close to or, or on average equal to the negative evidence lower bound. And these have been made to be efficient by some recent work. So what about flow models? So flow models are, as we all know, are smooth invertible maps between noise and data. And they are likelihood-based generative models. You do get a log density out of them. So we know that a coding algorithm must exist. But we want not just hypothetical coding algorithms, but efficient ones. And that's exactly what this work is about. We construct computational, computationally efficient compression algorithms for flows. So the way we do this is we locally approximate the flow as a VAE. You can do this for any flow by constructing an approximate posterior and a decoder, where the approximate posterior basically looks like the, the forward direction of the flow that takes data to a latent. And, and the, the decoder is just the opposite direction. And if you do this in just the right way, then the VAE bound will closely match the flow's log likelihood, which means that applying bits back coding gets the right code length for the flow. So that's why we call this algorithm local bits back coding, because it's bits back coding on a local approximation of the flow. This is, if you impl implement this in the straightforward way, it requires computing and factorizing the Jacobian of the flow. So this runs in polynomial time in the data dimension. 
So this is better than exponential time, which is what the naive procedure would take, but it's still not good enough for high-dimensional data. So continuing with the story, if you make additional assumptions on the structure of the generative model, you can make compression faster. So if we specialize our algorithm to the real NVP family of flows, then we get linear time, fully parallelizable compression algorithms. And the reason is that we can exploit the fact that these, these flows are made, a, made out of coupling layers and they're made out of compositions of them. And so we get linear time, fully parallelizable encoding and decoding in a way that very much mirrors the fact that these models also have, the, have linear time and fully parallelizable sampling and inference. So we implemented this for some, real, some recently proposed real NVP type models, and we get code lengths that are very close to theoretical predictions, as we expected. And to our knowledge, these are state-of-the-art, fully parallelizable compression algorithms on these data sets. One caveat is that these are bits back coding algorithms, which require so-called auxiliary bits to be available on both the encoder and decoder side. And so if these bits are not available, then the code length can degrade. And it turns out that it really is crucial to specify, to, to specialize our algorithm to the real NVP structure. By doing so, we get compression and decompression that takes very little time extra compared to just running the neural network on its own. Whereas if you make no such assumptions, then, then the algorithms are much slower. So in conclusion, we presented how, we, we present how to uh, do lossless compression with flow models. The naive algorithm takes exponential resources, our algorithm for general types of flows, it's polynomial time, and for the real MVP family, we get linear time and parallelizable compression. So please come to our poster for details, and all of our code is also open source, so you can look there. Thank you. All right, this concludes our session. Uh, let's thank all the speakers one more time. Thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the posters and the rest of the conference.